Hello, we're here with the Game of the Week winner from Week 4 of the United States Chess League. Grandmaster Conrad Holt played an exciting draw with Dennis Schmeloff. This is FM Mike Klein reporting for the U.S. Chess League. Uh, how are you doing tonight, Conrad? Uh, pretty good. Great. Well, it was an exciting game. We don't have too many draws that win Game of the Week, but tell us your general thoughts on the game. Um, well, I mean, it was, yeah, I was pretty happy with it, you know, even though I, you know, was, thought I was better, and so even though I let him um, get away with a draw, I had a lot of fun just playing it, and, and it secured a win for the team, so I was pretty happy with it. The team's doing great. You guys have yet to be defeated, and you're leading the Western Division. Now, I just talked with Dennis a few minutes ago, and he said that he thought he was better, but uh, you found this maneuver, Queen D8, followed by F5, and you really opened up his king. Did you think you were worse at that point, or did you think you were still in control? Um, well, I thought I meant my advantage had probably gone by that point, but um, I, didn't, I didn't ever think I was actually worse. But um, I tend to always think I'm winning, so I could be wrong. And now, is that a good mindset to have in chess, or is it sometimes better yeah. to deceive yourself? <laughs> it's probably not that good. Well, uh, when you played this whole queen d8 f5 idea, did, was everything all calculated, or were you just trying to mix up the game a little bit more and confuse the issue? Um, well, I mean, well, yeah, I was pretty sure I was not going to lose any material. I mean, I, I, knew, I, knew my, I knew he couldn't take my work or anything. Okay, well, yeah, that was clear. Now, he said that he said to me that he thought you that you missed queen g3, but it sounds like you didn't miss anything in there. It sounds like everything was worked out. No, I, I, didn't, I didn't get surprised at any point, I don't think. Okay, so you saw that rook, the uh, rook takes f5 maneuver. You saw that well in advance, it sounds like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see. Uh, were you able to identify any improvements in the game that you could have played? Is that just because you're too busy with school or something else? Um, well, I just didn't feel like it. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, um, one thing I could have done differently, like, is, um, like, I could have captured with a pawn on e5, like, instead of knight e5, and then I'm probably just better there. You know, I'm, I'm doing really, trolling all the dark squares and all, and this king side is full of balls and stuff. So that's a different way I could have gone. Now, you said you didn't look at your game at all. Did you look at the other Game of the Week nominees? And if so, were you surprised that, that your draw won Game of the Week? Um, or when, when I saw them, I thought I had a good chance because they had two in-game grinds. And so I, so I figured, you know, the in-game grind vote is going to be divided. And I'm going to, you know, take all the exciting votes. And so I should, you know, have a good chance. Yeah, that does always seem to be the way the voting works down, the, the technical masterpiece versus the exciting game, but uh, the exciting game often works out well. Now, it's kind of fitting because you, in your first ever USCL game, won game of the week in an exciting game too. So um, it goes to show you that you don't have to win your exciting games to win game of the week. Um, now, when I was talking with Dennis, he said that you walked into his opening preparation and that you can sometimes be predictable. Do you agree with this assessment? I'm definitely predictable. Like I always play the same thing against everything, but um, well, I don't think his preparation worked. I thought he, I thought I had like a better position. So I don't, I'm not sure what he means by walking into it. It sounds like a difference of opinion in the opening. <laughs> um, sometimes I guess this happens in the USCL. There's not a lot of post mortem that the two players do where they can, uh, you know, come to a consensus. Do you, do you think that uh, being predictable at some point will be a hindrance to your improvement? I mean, maybe, like, I mean, it'll occasionally happen that I will, you know, walk into some preparation and, yeah, you know, I suppose I might want to try some different openings at some point, but, um, I don't know, it's just really easy to just play the same stuff, and then, um, I just try to study it more than the opponent, so I'll be okay. Now, I'm looking at your rating stats online, and you seem to have started tournament chess a bit later than most grandmasters. Uh, I'm not sure if that's true or not, but how old were you when you started competing? Uh, 11. Yeah, it seems like most grandmasters would have gotten started by then. Do, do you, um, did you ever perceive yourself at being at a disadvantage, or do you think that Evan 11 is young enough to become a grandmaster? Wow. Uh, what I mean to say is a lot of grandmasters 
began the game at, you know, maybe six, seven, or eight years old. But did that ever seem like uh, a hindrance for you starting at the age of 11? I mean, like, I've never, you know, gotten stuck at some point and, like, you know, I've never been like, oh, you know, I can't get past 2100 or something like that. I've never, so it doesn't really seem to be any hindrance to improving or anything. Yeah, even a couple of years ago, you were in the 2100s and you've shot up to past 2500, so it's been really fast. You made IM last year and you just recently got your Grandmaster title at the concluded Olympiad. Um, did you think that the transition really? at the recently concluded Olympiad during the FIDE conference, uh, your, your Grandmaster title was, oh, yeah, was approved yeah. then? Uh, I, I realize you earned it earlier in, in March at the UTD Invitational, but did you think that the transition from IM to GM would come, would come so fast? I mean, I kind of did, you know, like, you know, whenever I go to a norm tournament, I always think I'm going to get a GM norm this time. <laughs> <laughs> and I so, usually, like, you know, um, I usually, like, feel really optimistic at the beginning, and then, like, I lose a game, and then I don't feel optimistic anymore, and so, um... I don't know. <laughs> well, about about how many tournaments did it take for you to get those three GM norms after you became an IM? Well, let's see. Okay, so well, my first one was at the Chicago Open 2011, and so then um, I guess I played a couple more norm tournaments that summer after that, and I didn't get anything. But um, then you know, my next two at UTD. I got a norm both times, so um, right. So, you know, it is less less than a year for all. Of them. It almost seems like you were batting five hundred in your norm eligible tournaments. Did, did you ever think about going to Europe? I realize you didn't seem to need to, but um, do you do you think that eventually you'll go to Europe to get better one day, like a lot of young American stars have? I mean, yeah, maybe. I mean, yeah, I did play in the World Junior in Greece, and that was that was a lot of fun. Yeah, and you scored well. You scored well there. Uh, what was your What was your final result? Um, my final result wasn't that great. It was like, um, I don't know, like tied for like I don't know seventeenth or something. Okay. I pretty much only did only did well in the first half. Um, how much do you think going to a chess school helps in your own chess improvement? You go to UTD. Well, I mean. Yeah, it's much easier, you know, than if I went to a school that didn't have any chess program. Like, you know, um, I mean, I wouldn't probably get to play any norm tournaments during a semester or anything like that. I'd have to, like, you know, try to get them in the summer or something. So that makes it a lot easier to improve and, and have time to study. Were you recruited by other chess schools? No, no, not that I recall. I think so. so uh, did did you give a lot of thought to going to um, a school that didn't have a chess program, or were you always convinced in high school that you were going to go to a school that had a chess program? Um, no, I was I was not convinced I'd go to a chess program. Like, um, like um, I thought I might just try to go to like you know a school that has a really good reputation. Like some like I applied to like you know like. MIT and Stanford, but um, I didn't get accepted to those schools. So um, then I just so then I went to UTD because so I didn't have to so I didn't have to debate between them that much. I because, see. Um, UTD just seemed like a really good choice. Like you know, if I went to another school, I might have to you know like um, you know pay forty thousand dollars in tuition or something. But, you know, in UT, I'm getting good scholarships, so it was a lot better. <laughs> right, it's a great financial deal. Um, do you predict that you might make chess a career upon graduation? Um, uh, not, not really. Like, like you know, um, probably not like rated high enough to make it a career or anything. Well, I mean, you're not rated high enough now, but, uh, you know, you, like you've said yourself, have never really plateaued, so do you think it's unreasonable that you might make 2,600 FIDE or something of that level someday? Um, yeah, but I mean, that's, I still wouldn't, 
I wouldn't try to have a career in chess if I was like twenty six hundred because, well, um, well, I mean, I could I could probably like you know give lessons or something, but I'm not really interested in that. I just prefer playing. So, um, and you know, it's not very easy to have a chess career in the U.S. or anything. So, I'd probably just um try to get a non chess job. Well, my next question was about uh, you know the possibility you've competed for the U.S. and the World Junior before what the chances would be for you to ever make our Olympiad team, but it sounds like that's not really a goal of yours. Is that right? Um, well, I wouldn't say that's true. Like, I think, I think that would be a lot of fun, you know, um, if I could make the Olympiad team. But, um, um, I mean, I just I haven't really thought about, you know, my future plans a whole lot, really. It, w- it would be interesting. I don't think it's too big of a stretch to say, you know, maybe – uh, six, eight years from now, uh, an Olympiad team of, you know, Hess, Shanklin, Robson, Naraditsky, you and Nakamura, I mean, some sort of like young all-stars dream team uh, of Americans would be would be awesome for the public to see. Um, and, you know, it's possible maybe that even if you had a day job, you could compete for the U.S., so we'll see if that comes about. Now, in the Game of the Week um, recap that Grandmaster Alex Yermolinsky does, he called you one of the most talented young players in the country. H- have you had uh, high praise like that before from any other grandmasters? Um, I mean, I can't. I, mean, I can't remember if, like, you know, a specific grandmaster said that or anything. But I mean, um, well, I'm sure you know, like, people have noted before that you know, I have one of the best, like, you know, rates of, like, you know, getting the most points in a year and stuff. Like, um, yes, in addition to your ratings increases, last year in your first USCL season, you had an amazing performance. You scored 9 out of 10, and your performance rating was in the mid-2700s. Uh, why do you think you played so well in the league? Um, maybe because, you know, like, I'm relatively a lot better at, like, um, internet chess than playing over the board. You know, I'm, I've played, you know, on ICC, you know, Ten times as much as I've um, played on a real chessboard, so that was I was kind of you know in my native element there. I see, and um, in researching the interview, I saw a game where you beat Nakamura online. Maybe you've done it several times, and I realized he was trying some funny openings. But uh, do you do you see that as being um, a big help to your chess career, like Nakamura always claims all the number of games you've played online? Huh. Do you see that as being one of the biggest reasons that you've gotten so good so quickly? Playing on ICC? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I never really would have gotten started in chess at all about ICC because, you know, in Kansas there's like, you know, two tournaments a year or something. Um, and growing up, how many hours a day or a week would you estimate you played on ICC? Um, I don't know, probably like five. Five a day? Like, you know, yeah, like, you know, like in middle school probably or something. Wow. Like, like I had like a percent of life was like 16 or something. But, you know, that includes a lot of time idling. So if you subtract some of it out, it would be like four or five hours a day. Yeah, that's more time than a lot of people sleep as a percentage of their life. So that's pretty amazing. Now, uh, it seems pretty obvious that one of the keys to being a good uh, team in the USCL is to have some young juniors that are underrated in the ratings list that is used. So, uh, to that end, do you think that a university team has a big advantage in the U.S. Chess League because all of the players seem to be under the age of 21? Um, well, actually, a lot of our players aren't. A lot of our players are like in their um, mid 20s, actually. But um, they are all think, they know, are they all they improving. Talk about the advantage from the rating from the um, juniors, I think. You're really talking about more like kids who are like 12 years old. That will mm-hmm. actually make like a, a real big statistical difference a lot of times. Although actually, um, I guess my rating like last year, it was um, quite a bit lower, like from the time the official rating was calculated. But um, in general, to like get a really big, you know, amount of extra points, you have to have like some pretty young kids. Right, and you guys don't usually have any 12 year olds that matriculate at UTD. <laughs> But, yeah, uh, but we have, um, you know, Jeffrey is on, and he always, you know, like, gains 100 points per year. <laughs> yeah, that is helpful. Now, last year uh, you were playing a lower board. This year we've already seen you on board one and board two. Do you, do you like competing on higher boards better or lower boards better? Um, well, 
board one time I've been on board one, you know, I lost and it's like a lot more fun to win, you know, <laughs> when you're on. Well, when I'm playing individually, I'd rather, you know, play strong players. But, you know, when, I, when I'm when i on a team, it's fun to um, play lower rated players so then I can win and, you know, we can all get a team victory. So I kind of like to play more on lower words. <laughs> Makes sense. Now, to be fair, it was your first loss ever, and it was to Grandmaster Sam Shanklin, so um, not too shabby. Um, let's talk about you for a second. What are you studying at UT Dallas? Uh, physics. And uh, any particular reason you like physics so much? Um, no, it's kind of random. Well, one presumes that you're good at it. Um, who, who else on the team do you hang out with socially? Um, so maybe like... Um, Maybe Julio Sedora and, I don't know, like Eric Hansen, except um, he had a problem with grades, you know. So um, he was on probation from the chess team. I see. So, it's, it's good to know that can happen to even chess players, although we hope he, he writes the ship. Uh, are, are there any classes that you really don't like or any fields of study that you just don't care for? Um, like, I really don't like, you know, something that involves writing. Um, like, you know, but I, I got, um, I got an AP credit out of English, so I don't have to do that. Uh, planning ahead like a good chess player, I see. Yeah. Uh, well, do you have any predictions for the remainder of the season? You guys are, are sitting, uh, at sole first place right now in the Western Division with three and a half out of four. Any predictions? Um, wait, what was the question? Uh, is there any predictions for the destiny for the rest of the season? Um. Like, I mean, I guess we'll keep doing pretty well, you know. At the beginning of the season, we were having, I mean, we're actually only going to do better from now on because we can have two GMs um, play each week, and due to our lineup change, and at the beginning, we could only have one GM playing a given week. So, you know, um, we're probably going to continue to win a lot of uh, matches. Yeah, two GM lineups are definitely tough. Well, uh, the lineups for Week 5 were just announced literally 10 minutes ago, and uh, you have White for your first time of the year against International Master Amonov of the LA Vibe. Where um, White? I thought I had Black. <laughs> uh, perhaps I got it wrong, but you are on board too. I could, definitely could have read it wrong. So uh, you will be a favorite again, and I know the Destiny could use your point. So, uh, yeah, I thought we had, a, um, we had Team White. And I'm on board too, and that makes me black. Yeah, I think you were listening to the left-hand column, and that always confuses me a bit. So please go online and check your actual opponent, and do not listen to me. As we saw in the Ryder Cup today, when Rory McIlroy listened to the TV, he almost ended up late for his uh, his match. And uh, so don't don't believe the media can get you in trouble. But uh, anyway, thanks very much for your time, Conrad. Um, we also want to thank our sponsors for the United States Chess League, Poker Stars, the ICC and chess.com. Thanks very much, Conrad. Good luck this week.